chapter 4, The Third Harvest, had indeed come, and this one I would not be allowed to ignore. My father wanted to show off his princess to his newly promised son-in-law. Every year, when the hostages were brought, Crete held funeral games in honor of Andromedius, and this year I was to attend. No more hiding in corners would be permitted. Although several years my junior, Phaedra had prevailed on him to include her as well. Her handmaid and my handmaid set a crown upon my head, bound silver sandals to my feet, and robed me in rich blue fabric, what fell like water through my fingers. Although the clothes were beautiful, I felt as though they did not belong to me and I cringed at the prospect of so many eyes being drawn to my finery. I had had quite enough of being stared at and talked about for one lifetime, and so it was that I slunk rather than glided to my seat at the very side of the arena. Of course, Cyneris waited for me already lounging on the cushions heaped up for his comfort, at his elbow was a hot jug of wine, and I gathered her. He had already drunk deeply of judging by the re reddened flush of his face. I hesitated, looked at where Minus stood, at his podium in the center ready to open the ceremonies. His face flared with satisfaction like a bright coin as he watched my discomfort. My legs moved against my will. I would not let my father see me falter or let him luxuriate in my reluctance. Cyneris smiled less lasciviously, as I said, rigid, beside him. I was grateful for the shade that protected me, and sorry for the competitors who would toil beneath the sun's searing glare. I could hardly make out what was happening in that great golden dazzle, but the buzz of the crowd died away, and I heard the panicked snorting and low bellows of the bull, bedecked with garlands as it was led out before us. Although it rolled its big round eyes and skittered at first, a soft calm descended upon the creature as it approached the altar. I'd seen it many times, the piece that suited an animal on the point of death. It couldn't see the concealed blade, but... All the same, perhaps, it knew its blood would spill for the glory of the gods, and perhaps such a worthy death seemed like a prize. It stepped forward, docile and placid. The rituals were performed, and the knife plunged into its smooth, white throat. The blood gleamed in the sunlight as it gushed from the altar. The gods were honored and would smile on our celebrations. The beast's noble had slumped the crimson ribbons that decorated its horn lustrous above the thick roby river that flowed across the stone. For a moment I saw the minotaur pacing his sunless prison, alone for all the days of every year except the morrow, and I saw Androgeus, his handsome figure blurred in my memory my own flesh and blood, but truly a stranger to me, gored upon the horns of a different bull. My brothers, their tragedies, alike had led us to this place. The watching crowds and the sacrificial beasts that died dumbly in our sight today, then the other unfortunates who would meet their death tomorrow in the dark torn apart by the senseless, savage animal I had once thought I could tame. The games commenced. Men raced on foot and in chariots, tossed spears, hurled the discus, and grappled one another in boxing matches. Sweat poured from the con contestants' temples. A bead trickled down my back. I shifted uncomfortably, wishing it was over. On one side of me, Cyneris drank and cheered, one hand resting damp and heavy on my thigh. I ground my teeth, swallowed my humiliation, tried to shift away, though it only made his fingers clamp more tightly. On my other side, Fabra 
was enraptured. How much longer will this continue? I muttered. She was incredulous at my lack of enthusiasm. Harriadne, this is the most excitement we ever see. She tossed her blonde hair in rep reproof. I longed for the solitude of my dancing floor, wished I was beating out my frustrations on its smooth wooden face. That alone would erase the image of tomorrow. How the lonely labyrinth would be so briefly enlivened with the chase and the screams and the ripping away of flesh from bones. And the ship I was to board, the life that waited me over the waves in Cyprus. I swallowed and forced myself to look at the arena, but to distract my mind from its own grim imaginings. A cloud passed briefly over the sun, and I saw clearly for the first time. Who's that? I asked. So far I had recognized many of the young men competing, the preeminent youth of Crete mainly all jostling for supremacy. But the youth who stepped forward now to the wrestling ground was not familiar to me at all, unless I sat forward, scrutinizing his face. I had seen him before, but I could not understand how this could be. He was tall and broad-shouldered, his strength evident in his easy stance and in the muscles that brought to mind the palace's finest marble statues. He strode with such confidence and assurance that I was confused as to how he could be a stranger to the place but look so at home. Theseus, Prince of Athens, Phaedra whispered to me. It wasn't just the impossibility of the words. Athens hated us with just justified bitterness. Why would their prince compete in our games? But something in her tone made me glance at her sharply. She didn't take her eyes from him as she went on. He asked Minos directly to take part in the games, so was freed from his bondage for this afternoon only. Athens, freed from his bondage. You mean his tribute? I squeaked disbelievingly. The prince himself brought in chains as our sacrifice. Why would Athens send its own prince? He volunteered, she replied, and this time she, the dreaminess, in her voice was undeniable. He couldn't allow the children of his countrymen to come alone, so he took the place of one of them. A fool, Sinraeus snorted. For a moment we watched Theseus in silence as I absorbed my sister's words. Where would one find the courage to do such a thing, I wondered, to cast away a life of riches and power and anything he desired? to give his life in the very prime of his youth for his people, to go knowingly and willingly into the snaking coils of our dungeon as a living meat for our monster. I stared at this Theseus, as if by looking hard enough at him I could decipher the thoughts being that behind that calm face. It must be a mask, I thought. A veneer of ease laid over the frantic racing of his mind. How could anyone not be driven mad by the prospect of what lay just hours ahead of him? I thought I might have my answers when his opponent stepped out. Taurus, my father's general, a huge hulking colossus man. His sneering face with its squat, toad-like nose was as ugly as Theseus's was beautiful. Veins clustered over his bulging muscles like ropes, glistening horridly with oil. His cruelty was famed across Crete, an arrogant man devoid of sympathy, a brute barely more civilized than my youngest brother, bellowing beneath the stony ground. Perhaps Theseus had weighed things up and preferred to choke to death in Taurus's deadly grip out here in the light of day than be devoured in the coal-black pit. They clashed with shocking force. Taurus was far bigger than Theseus, and it seemed he must surely be victorious, but I had underestimated the value of skill against sheer bulk. 
I didn't realize how far forward I sat in my seat and how tightly I clenched the wooden bench beneath me until I spotted Fedra in a similar attitude of fixation and collected myself once more. The two men gripped one another in a horrifying embrace, twisting and striving to throw the other. I could see the sweat in rivers on their backs and the agony carved into every straining muscle. Vast as he was, Taurus's eyes were be beginning to bulge from his head, giving him an expression of crazed disbelief as slowly but inexorably. Theseus gained the upper hand and drove him further and further to the ground. In an ecstasy of anticipation we watched, holding our breath so silently that I was sure I could hear the cracking of bones. When Taurus's back crashed to the earth, the cheers from the crowd were deafening. This courageous prince's story had evidently won their admiration. I knew, though, that it had no impact on their avid desire to see him fed alive to the ravenous Minotaur the following evening. How delicious to have this prison to lace the bloody excitement. His royalty, his bravery, and his victory made an irresistible blend. The games wore on and prizes were awarded. It did not stir my interest again until Theseus was led to the podium. Minos was in full flow, expansive and generous as he smiled broadly and placed an arm around Theseus's shoulder. The greatest prize we give today is usually the olive wreath, he declaimed. But today an extraordinary performance merits an extraordinary prize. Theseus, prince of Athens, in honor of your mighty fist today, I give you your freedom. You will sail home tomorrow with the treasure you brought in offering to us. I sighed with intense relief. Beside me, Fedra did the same, her hand clasped to her heart, as though to claim its racing pulse. Theseus looked grave. I thank you for your benevolence, King Minos, but I cannot accept the generous honor you have extended to me. I swore to keep my brothers and sisters of Athens company on their journey into the unknown darkness tomorrow, and I must not withdraw that now. I will keep my oath. Cinyris had been taking a long draught of wine, and at this he spluttered. Red drops shovered over his robes, sinking into the extravagant purple. His face was stunned and stupid after the florid speeches Minos had made all afternoon. Theseus's succinct refusal sounded curt and entirely unexpected. My father wiped the shock from his face, but I could see the anger smoldering in his eyes. Your honor and your courage are indeed as great as I had heard, he answered. Crete welcomes your sacrifice. He swung to face me. Ariadne, he commanded. I jumped. What had I done? Had Minos's cold gaze penetrated my very thoughts? Did he know how my rebellious heart surged with admiration for the man who had just so very publicly embarrassed him? My eldest daughter, Minos went on. He gestured at me to stand. Haltingly, I rose, feeling the gaze of hundreds rest suddenly upon me. The princess of Crete will crown your victor of our games. I hadn't expected this. It had never been required of me before. I wondered if it was in some way to impress Cyneris, or simply that he couldn't trust himself to place the wrath on Theseus's head without smashing it down in a fit of undignified temper. With Minos's glare intent on me, I had no choice but to force myself forward towards the podium. At first I cringed under the weight of everyone's stares, but then I looked towards Theseus and saw him watching me. His eyes were calm and steady. All at once the crowd merged into the background and I looked only at him. And then I was in front of him and I couldn't hold his gaze any longer. The wrath was placed in my hands, but Minos or a servant, I couldn't tell. I was too acutely aware of Theseus is inches away from me. His head ducked down, my fumbling fingers dropped 
the wreath upon his hair, and I step back, almost tripping on the long trail of my skirt. I think there was a scattering of applause. As I turned back to my seat, I saw Cyneris, the wine jug swinging from his hand, and the spark of accusation kindling across the, his drink-sodden face. The celebratory atmosphere dissipated a little after this. Tisius's quiet dignity had confused us all. I think there were some who would have gladly watched him walk free with his life intact and his body unscathed, and then there were those suspicious of his unwillingness to accept such a gift, perhaps thinking he meant it as an insult to Minus and thereby an insult to all of Crete. As the day drew to a slightly discomfited close, Tadra and I rose to leave. With no courtesy, Cyneris pushed past us in his stained robes. Tadra looked crushed, and I could see the gathering of unshed tears glistening in her eyes. She was soft-hearted, my little sister, and she bore no love or loyalty for the Minotaur. Tears Theseus's display had moved her, and I grieved for the shattering of her idealistic dreams, but I couldn't pretend that it was sympathy for Phaedra that made me glance back at the podium where Theseus had stood. Something else pulled me to it, and my feet were heavy as I forced them in the other direction. Over the mountains, the orange flame of the sun was sinking. Helios drove his mighty chariot beyond the horizon, leaving the world to darkness. And now to the great hall to feast, bowels of feet and bronze inlaid with gems and painted figures adorning the outside, piled high with meat, fish, fruit, honey, glistening olives and crumbling slabs of salty, white cheese. Wine flowed and musicians played singing stories of gods, heroes, treasures and monsters. It was a great display of wealth and power, and it was with a jolt that I saw Minos had commanded the Athenian captives to observe the celebrations. My appalled eyes ran over the line, seven boys, seven girls, all so young. I saw the face of the boy in the center twist as he tried to master his trembling mouth and pull it into a straight line. I forced myself not to look away, but to take in the face of each of Athens' children that we had brought here to murder. Fourteen faces. Thirteen of them were terrified, eyes reddened and hands shaking. I wondered what it cost them to stay standing. The fourteen face. I did not have to wonder. I could see Theseus much closer in this hall than in the arena, and it filled me with mingling emotions. What good did it? do to look upon him now when he would die tomorrow. Minus' his cruelty in displaying his tributes was marked. His reasoning was thus, it was in the dear honor that we feasted. Whilst excited chatter and laughter rang through the hall, the bound tributes watched. Flanked by gods, hands died before them. They trembled and prayed, waiting to be devoured at sunset next day. The Athenians weren't the only ones Minos displayed at the front of the hall, just beside the grand table at which my family were seated, sat Daedalus. His face wore more years than he'd lived, his hair whitened, although he was not yet old. Around Knossos, his creations bore testament to Minos' supremacy. Daedalus' skill was unrivaled in the world, and he belonged to Crete. His most famed creation was one that few people ever saw. Perhaps the hostages should feel honored that they would have the privilege of not only seeing but actually treating its intricate pathways. Perhaps not. It would be too dark to appreciate its wonders and the frenzied bellowing of the maddened monster intent upon tearing them limb from limb with detract from the O one might otherwise feel. I knew Daedalus bore that knowledge, and it crushed his shoulders down to the slump 
he now wore, no longer the straight-backed, avancular inventor of my childhood, who had come to Crete to develop his craft. He was the master of it, and whilst he wore no chains, he could never leave Crete as long as Minos desired to hold the secrets of the labyrinth close. It was not Daedalus that I watched that evening, though. I found that I couldn't tear my eyes from the Athenians, one in particular. I wonder if the heroes the bard sang of that evening knew before they triumphed what they would become. In those crucial moments, when fateful decisions were made, did they feel the air brighten with the zing of destiny? Or did they blunder on, not realizing the pivotal moment in which destiny swung and fates were forged? I don't know what I felt when my eyes met Theseus's curiosity, certainly. He stood tall and jutted his jaw forward, betrayed by no shaking or sobs. He held my gaze with a cool impudence, as though I were not a princess and he were not a sacrificial offering. It did not feel momentous. Yet, when I tore my eyes away from his, I found that nothing looked quite the same, as though the world had fractured and sheared away from itself to reshape in almost, but not quite, the same formation. As though I had looked at a waterfall and realized, with a faint jolt, that the water flowing over the rock was ever-changing, that it would never be the same water again.